Thank you, man, for the music. Appreciate it. Especially love that last last line. So. People who don't get the gospel can't worship. You're lying to yourself because you don't get the gospel. Because right now, all of us, every single one of us, deserve hell. But it's only by grace, because of the gospel, because there is no other gospel but the true gospel. So this morning, as we begin, as we continue with our study this morning, We will continue from John chapter 12, verses 20 to 26. John chapter 12, verse 20, verses 20 to 26. Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life and this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Thank you, Father, for this time where we can come before your throne of grace. May we find mercy in such a time as this. Help us to go to this text, such a powerful message. We ask all this, Father, in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Sir, we want to see Jesus. As we are working our way through the book of John, last time we saw the mindsets of the religious leaders in verse 19, and they said to one another, you see that you gain nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. And they, they, they summarized that they were spinning their wheels. And they were not making any progress about killing Jesus. Then to add insult to injuries, now they were saying, now even Gentiles now are coming to seek Jesus. When you study the Bible, you must see things, always see things from a divine perspective. If the commentary you are reading doesn't give you that, throw it out, get a new one. You must see things from a divine perspective. Why? Because the fact is, Jesus came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. John reminds us that he came unto his own people and they did not receive him. They rejected him as Messiah, Savior, and Redeemer. Why? Because there had to be a time of the Gentiles. What do you mean by that? God has set aside the Jews for a time because the gospel had to go forth and Gentiles will believe it. Because on that very day, when they proclaim, Hosanna, 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 when you, those who calculate those numbers, these are the 62 weeks in Daniel were completed. And there's one more week now that must take place but that's for the time of tribulation. 
That was in worship at that time. But it was scripture that had to be fulfilled. Because John tells us in John 1.12, but as many as receive him, <laughs> to them he gives the right. Adoption these days is done in a manner that, okay, someone may adopt someone, you don't even know they adopted. But back in the day, when you adopted someone, this was done in the open square. It was in an open forum. So everyone would know, you know what? We adopted this person, and because we saw him, and we love him, and we adopted him, therefore, this person now all the rights and privileges of that family. That's the same thing God the Father did for you and I, because we are not part of the family. He gave them the right. Now we have become children of God. To those who believe in his name. See, you got to believe in his name. You, got, you must come to the cross. It's not something you get because I'm a good person. I was born in this religion or that religion. That doesn't say. It doesn't. How you become a Christian? That's right there. To those, one, believe in his name. We are not born of the blood and flesh and blood, nor the will of men. Your mom and dad decided long ago, you know, let's have a baby. Great. And uh, voila, here you came. Is that what saves you? No. It's those who God called, chose, elected. And who are these people? There are three groups, basically, Jews, Samaritan, and Gentiles. At this point in time, many people came from outside now. As we look, look at our text, many people came for the feast of the Passover, and they were there. Many people from outside Jerusalem. And what were they, why were they looking for? Because understand this, what happened previously, the miracle of bringing someone back from the dead was the news. There was no major network to tell you, okay, breaking news, this just happened. But guess what? People use what they had, word of mouth. And everyone that's coming into Jerusalem is, are listening to this one thing. So people were seeking Jesus. They wanted to see. Some might have been present. And so Lazarus walked out of the grave. Others heard the eyewitness account of the resurrection of Lazarus. See, for this reason, they wanted to see and hear from Jesus himself. See, at this time, I pause and consider, was it really them seeking to see God, or was it God seeking them? See, people who believe in free will will tell you, well, it's man seeking God. Really? I beg to differ. God always seeks the sinner. Why? Because the sinner does not have it in him to seek God. Why would you say that? He's spiritually dead. What can a dead person do? With me now? Dead. Therefore, the Holy Spirit is the one who beckons and convicts the sinner to see God, to come to God. Whether it's by, oh, I want to see this. But God is doing the work in their hearts and mind. Salvation is the work of God. Because the sinner is unable, unwilling, and incapable to come to saving faith on his own. Why? This is the sovereignty of God in salvation. Because the sinner is born in sin, the sinner loves his sin, the sinner loves the darkness, the sinner hates the light, and the sinner refuses to see God because he can't. He's unable. Like Lazarus, God must call, bring, and empower the sinner to come to him. And that sometimes comes more drastically than others. Some of us heard a message and they say, right, and we, we believed. 
Some people got to go to serious issues, and it's like, okay, Lord, I give up. When you listen to the book of Acts in chapter 13, 47 and 48, for the Lord has commanded us, I have appointed you as a light to the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentile heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and all who had been appointed. That's the sovereignty of God. That's having a biblical perspective. All who have been appointed. Appointed mean chosen, selected, elected to eternal life. What happened to them? They believe. Salvation was not for one group of people. In the eternal counsel of God, he sought, he sought to save from every tribe, every tongue, and language. That included every nation on planet Earth. When you look at Luke 13, 29, he tells us, they will come from the east and from the west, from the north and south, and will recline at the table in the kingdom of God. Notice, they will come from the four corners of the globe. They will come from every ethnic group, dialect, and languages. You know, by, by the way, you see people on television, they like to argue about many races. There are not many races. There is one race. That's the human race in a story. Notice the words in Isaiah 42, verse 2. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. And Isaiah continues in verse 6, he says, I am Yahweh. I have called you in righteousness. I will also take hold of you and by the, and by the hand and guard you. I will give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nation. Again, keep in mind, the Bible declares that all men died in Adam. As a result, we were born, in, we were born sinners, we were sinners by choice, and we were sinners by nature. Because that's what Romans 3.23 tells, says, for all have sinned. How many? All. How many good people on planet Earth? Zero. Ouch. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, notice the gravity of our spiritual condition. Same chapter, Romans 3, 11 and 12. There is none, see, in case, <laughs> there is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God, there is none who does good, there is not even one. Now, you give this book to an unbeliever and you tell them to read the Bible and they read this, why should the unsaved desire to read the Bible? This is the most offensive book ever written. No one wants to be insulted. However, Remember, we got to look at things from a godly perspective. But God, I love this. You know how many people have tried to debunk the Bible? You know how many people have tried to prove God is wrong? There is no such thing or what Jesus has done. And at the end, they come crawling on their knees and beg for forgiveness? Every single one of them. But God. And his grace calls, redeem, and saves sinners. Then the sinners, and this is the amazing part, sinners are justified, declared right, made right in the sight of God. See, God the Father did this gracious saving miracle to Jesus Christ by his death, burial, and resurrection. That's not the end. Then God commands everyone, everyone to repent. Amazingly, upon repentance, God freed us from the penalty of our sins. The consequences of our sins. And one day soon, from the very presence of sin, when you become glorified, when you see him, you are transformed, sin will be eradicated from your mind and body. 
because you will be like him. For this reason, the gospel is good news for everyone. The gospel is for the rejected, the destitute, the down and out, the blind, the poor, the rich, the powerful, the genius, as well as the nobodies. Isaiah 42, 7, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and to those who inhabit darkness from the prison. The gospel, again, is good news for every people group. Isaiah 60, verse 3, nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Jesus chose 12 disciples, right? And somehow, he had some other guy in training in Judaism. And at the right time, and he said, Saul, you're a chosen vessel. Why? Paul needed to go to the training that he received so he can stand in front of kings, of those in power, so he can present the Jewish mindset in Christianity. This is why Felix trembled when he heard Paul preach. You couldn't send Peter. Peter didn't have it. Peter was for a different task. But he could send Paul. God always has someone in training. You may not know him. This is why you don't need to worry about tomorrow. He's got that. Do your part today. Acts 15, 14. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentile a people for his name. Wow. From among the Gentiles. They're going to come from everywhere. And brothers and sisters, and this is the amazing picture I want you to see. First, see the risen Savior. And think about one day when we are finally home. America is not your home. When you're finally home, you're going to see people you said goodbye to for a while back. Where sin will be no more when you finally see Christ. And you're going to see the number of people there. And the joy at that moment to see the exalted, risen Savior, it will be worth it all. So that's my introduction. Today we'll examine three points. The Greek sought Jesus, the glorification shown, and the germ of life. Since there is no evening service tonight, so I'm going to preach. The Greek sought Jesus. Who are these Greeks? Why were they seeking Jesus? Did they get their question answered? Now, take you back in time now. The Passover was near. The Passover is a few days now away. And it was recommended, it was commended by God back in the day that at the Passover that the, all Jews to attend the Passover, drop everything and go. So they traveled in large groups and they ascended. This is why you see the song of ascent, the Psalms of Ascent, okay, like Psalm 121 and so forth. There's a group of them that they would sing on the way up to Jerusalem. You always go up to Jerusalem. However, because of Jewish presence, there were Gentiles who were seeking God. They were converted to Judaism. And there were some of them as well now coming, going to this Passover. It is at this last Passover, last official Passover. Why am I saying it's the last one? Because Jesus did away with this. This is why next week we're going to celebrate the last Passover. Because the veil of the temple, what happened to it? How did it destroy it? From top to say, God did this. You know what the Jews, by the way, they took it back and they sewed it back up and put it back up. <sighs> anyway, let's continue. So in those days, Gentile proselyte who converted to Judaism, they also attended the feast as well. Now, these Greeks from outside Jerusalem who attended the Passover feast sought Jesus 
and an honest way for the truth. These Greeks understood life is a terminal in illness because the first death is the end to human life. So they wanted to live and have hope beyond the grave. And a few days, Jesus will destroy death. Again, think about it. This is humanity's greatest enemy, death. And people everywhere are hopelessly looking for answers. Everyone want to know, has anyone destroyed death? What's a remedy for death? How do I escape death? They are hopelessly still looking for answers. The world is still asking, has someone resolved the problem of death? People everywhere are afraid of death because they are afraid of what's beyond the grave and they don't know the truth. Listen, Jesus is the only answer. There is no other answer because Jesus rose from the grave. With his death, he paved the way to eternal life and Jesus alone gives hope beyond the grave. The Greeks now sought to know the way, the truth and the life. They sought insight only the Son of Man could provide. They desired to know the truth, the way, the true way, and the true freedom, the eternal life and its implication. Imagine you go somewhere, you travel, and you're hearing this about someone, but you don't know this person. And because people are trying to kill Jesus, he quite sure his disciples were protective of him. So you just you could not come up to him and say, hi, I would like to meet you. Do you see with the Greeks, the, these Greeks have a problem. They couldn't meet Jesus. The, these people, they did not have the right connection. So what did they do? Your Bible is still open. Look at verse 21. Notice in verse 21. These came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee. Why is John telling us this detail? What's this got to do with anything? That's why you got to dig deeper. Bethsaida. Hmm, Bethsaida. It is a town in Galilee on the west side of the Sea of Tiberias in the land of Gennesareth. It was the native place of Peter, Andrew, and Philip. Isn't that interesting? A place frequently visited by Jesus. Now, some of you may recall the incident which for their stubborn unbelief, Bethsaida, as well as Capernaum and Chorazin, were cursed by the Lord in Luke 10, 13 to 15. What Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in south cloth in ashes. But it will be more bearable and the judgment for Tyre and Sidon then for you. In you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades. So as a result, Bethsaida was remembered for its stubbornness and lack of faith. Think of that. Bethsaida is remembered for its stubbornness and lack of faith. And where are these men coming from? Bethsaida. You tell me God is not a gracious God. See, Bethsaida came to represent those who have heard the gospel, understood God's plan of salvation, and they rejected it. Interestingly enough, these Greeks are from the same region. Now, if I'm somewhere speaking English and someone from my country comes and listens to me, or who has been here a while, they're gonna say, hmm, this guy is not from the US. He's probably from the Caribbean, but which one? Which island? Would you rather approach you if he's from the same region? Would you rather approach you or me? It'll come to me, why? We have something in common. The language gave me up. Well, they approached Philip. That was too easy, they approached Philip and they made their request. We want to see Jesus. 
We, we want to see Jesus. It's not, it's not we want to see him. Oh, hi, how are you? No. We want to have a sit down. We, we, we want to have the Bible explained to us. Give us clarity. Give us insight. Give us understanding. That's what they were saying. See, here they find Philip. Philip was their point of contact, someone they could relate to. So Philip seems like the guy who was approachable, dependable, and available. Philip was one of the guys behind the scene. They do the heavy lifting. They never complain, but they never appear on the 10 o'clock news. See, they do what is required without fanfare, without applause. People like Philip, they show up, they work hard, they're faithful, they're dependable, reliable, and available. See, the reality is, I dare to say, a ministry cannot function without people like Philip. There are countless men and women who give their all, their best to the Lord, and quite often don't ever get the recognition that they should get. But, Fear not, beloved, if all those Philips are there. Your labor in the Lord will not be in vain. Because First Corinthians is written for you. My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So what does Philip do with this information? Philip came and reported to Andrew. We see in verse 22, Philip came and told Andrew, Andrew, and Philip came and told Jesus. These two disciples approached Jesus and reported that these Gentiles, Greek Gentiles, wanted to speak with you. These Greeks wanted to speak and meet and spend time with Jesus. And this brings me to my second point, the glorification shown. Look at verse 23. And Jesus answered them and said, the hour, of, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Whoa, what, what, what was the question? We don't know. But I'm quite sure it had to do with some of the questions that they ask. John doesn't tell us. But Jesus answered. If you were answering, someone must ask you a question. Or perhaps he read their minds, like he read Nicodemus' mind in John chapter 3. Because the question Nicodemus asked is not the one Jesus answered. Jesus answered the one that was in his heart. See, sometimes people ask a question, but the real question they want asked, they're afraid to ask. So it's that question that Jesus answered in John chapter 3. He answered Nicodemus' question, the one he refused to ask. You know what I call these questions? Dumb questions. Why? Because you went home without an answer. It's a dumb question. There are no dumb questions, except for those you don't know the answer to. If you got a question, ask. What does it say? Ask and it shall be. So if you don't know, it's your fault. That's why it's dumb. Another short counseling session. <laughs> no, that's not true. But as we look at this, the hour has come. Wait a minute. So many times, I, I, I did not want to give you all the numbers, but so many times Jesus has said, my hour has not yet come. When the people tried to make him king by force, Jesus went opposite direction. Again, the reason for his refusal was there had to be a cross before the crown. He didn't want these people to elect him, put him king. Because the same people who are fleshly in their decision making will be the same one say crucify him. See, Jesus came on a redemptive mission. And this saving mission involved the passion of Christ, the cross, the grave, the resurrection, and his ascension. My hour has not yet come. This statement has to do with Jesus' death and exaltation. Let me read a few verses for you. John 6:30, I mean John 7:30. So they were seeking to seize him, yet no man laid his hands on him. Why? Because his hour had not yet come. John 8:20. 
The word he spoke in the sanctuary he was, as he was teaching in the temple, and no one sees him because his hour had not yet come. Another one, John 12, 27. We saw that recently. Now my soul has become dismayed, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Again, we see in John 17, 1, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that the son may be glorified. Yeah, keep in mind, when you begin six, uh, uh, chapter 13 to 17, all this is happening on Thursday night. All this is on Thursday night. Imagine what John left out. This is why if they wrote every single word, you couldn't carry that book. See, Jesus must to work, must work to work of the Father who sent him to make propitiation for sin. Because the plan of God was for the Lamb of God to die, to save vile, wretched sinners. See, as humanity is looking for answer, going in the woods and yelling and screaming. The other day I saw on television, they had this bunch of ladies in the woods and they're yelling and screaming and they are beating on things and they said that relieves stress and all that. And they pay money for it. I'm like, why didn't I think come up with this plan? But anyway, no. What? See, the thing is, you can do anything under the sun, but who is going to deliver you from this body of death? Because you will face death. It's coming. It's not if, it's when. See, the only one who can do that is Jesus Christ. Only one. And Paul said, I'm the worst sinner. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? See, this is where we found salvation in Christ alone. It was all according to God's plan. And the fullness of time, at this specific time in history, the second person of the Trinity must be glorified. Meaning what? He must die. He must be lifted up. He must be hung on the cross. And there the Father will be glorified. And when he's up on that cross, he will prove once and for all that God loves you beyond measure. So don't you ever question if God loves you or not. No matter what you face on this side of glory. Because he killed his son so you can have life, be, have hope beyond the grave. Because Jesus will bring all men to himself. Brothers and sisters, that's the power of the cross. Meaning what? Jews. Samaritan and Gentiles will be saved. Does that mean everybody? No. It's limited atonement. But what he did at the cross is able to save the globe. But not everyone will be saved. We know that. And sin and death will be propitiated. The work of salvation begins, the work of salvation begins at salvation, and it ends in glorification. And it's paid in full. Acts 17 30. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, see, there was a time men did not know any better. Why? Because the cross did not. Uh, uh, Romans 5 8, God displayed his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. That has not taken place. But now that has taken place, he's telling us, he's commending men that everyone everywhere must repent. See, this divine timetable was foreordained by God before time began. Now, in the last day, would see its fulfillment with the glorification of the Messiah. All the requirements for Jesus' glorification were prearranged, satisfied, and fulfilled. This was set before time began. Notice Jesus brought the good news of the gospel to his own people. They rejected it. As well, Paul faced a similar dilemma with the Jews in Acts 13, 45. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul. And they were blaspheming. 
In Acts 18, 6, when they resisted in blaspheme, he shook out his garment and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. See, Jesus brings good news. The saving gospel and the Greeks came and they were seeking Jesus. Here we see Christ announcing to Gentiles his glorification. See, we see in verse 23, Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man must be glorified. Now, if you were sleeping, if you doze off, you were thinking, what am I gonna do for lunch and all that now? Come back, regroup. It is extremely interesting. Jesus began his ministry and he says, I am the Messiah. And what group of people, what person did he reveal that information to? A woman. Oh, it must have been a Jewish woman. No, it was a Samaritan woman. Hmm, interesting. So what is he doing here? Who is he speaking with? Greeks, Gentiles. You see the point? I'm Messiah to a woman, a Samaritan. I'm about to die. We don't know all the details of what he said, but one has to imply that he told them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Again, Jesus meet with these Gentiles. These, the Samaritan woman was lost and was sinful, and Jesus revealed that information to them. But these guys were religious, but they were lost. And he still tells them, the time of my glorification has come. So what is he doing? He's sharing the gospel with them. There is nothing else he could have called, told them. He had to tell them the gospel. So he met and he shared the gospel with sinners, lost, hopeless, destitute, and by the grace of God, they heard the truth, the whole truth. See, the spirit of the Holy Spirit was working in their hearts and mind, and he brought, and he brought them to Jerusalem, and they met with Jesus. Why? Because Yahweh is the God of salvation. He saves. That's what God does. He saves. He redeems. Isaiah 45, 22. Turn to me. <laughs> Don't go to idols. Don't go to this and that and, and, and thinking you got to do penance. You got to do X, Y, and Z. Come to me. And no one else and be saved. Because there is no other way to be saved. Because I am Yahweh, I save. Come to me and be saved. All the ends of the world. For I am God. <laughs> Again, the implication is there is no other. There is no other. Oh, you know, I love this word in Isaiah 55. Oh, everyone who thirsts. What do you do if you're thirsty? Come to the waters. Not H2O, because you'll be thirsty again. And you who have no money, come and buy. I mean, if you have no money, how can you buy anything? You can't. But when you, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why? Because the salvation God is giving you, it's free for the taking. Because Jesus paid it all. It is finished. There has never, there was never a greater sacrifice than this. Revelation 22, 17, and the spirit of the bride said, come. Let the one who hears says, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes receive the water of life without cost. Listen, God has put eternity in the heart of every human being. Nothing in this world will ever satisfy your soul and give you peace beyond the grave. 
until you come to the one who created you. That is why you need Jesus Christ who destroyed death and Jesus alone will give you hope beyond the grave because hope is found in Jesus Christ alone and this is why you must repent and believe the gospel. Looking back at our text, the remaining dialogue in the passage rests upon that statement. God's plan of salvation is brought forth by the Lamb of God, the high priest and sacrifice. And, and who is this? Jesus Christ. Again, notice the facts. The hour, the plan, the program, the redemption, salvation, propitiation, substitution, justification, and the glorification were part of the plan being unfolded for sinners sake. This Greek came and they had their question answered. Wow. There are time in history, I say, if time travel were possible, I would like to be there. That's one of those moments. What is it Brother John left out? <laughs> oh, but we can't. So we have to go with what we have. And this brings me to my last point, the germ of life. Look at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What does this got to do with anything? You just told them the hour has come. Now you tell them about a grain of wheat. Well, Jesus began with his double amen, which is very familiar. Verily, verily, which is amen and amen. Why does he say that? He is the God of truth. He doesn't lie. He can't say amen, amen. He doesn't end your approbation. Because what he's saying is true. His illustration and language were clear, specific, direct to the point. And all the people should have understood what Jesus was talking about. Because in this culture, you understand, I was thinking to bring a gun of some kind of seed with me, but I forgot. But you break any seed. You can have it in your hand, look at it, admire it, play with it, do anything you want, but it's dead until you put it where? In the ground. So what happened? See, however, Jesus referred to his glorification as a grain of wheat falling into the ground and dying and producing much fruit. Back in the Old Testament, Jacob regarded his children as his possession and his glory. Paul provided additional support for us with that concept in 1 Corinthians 15, 36 to 38. And he begins, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body just as he wishes to each of the seeds a body of his own. What is Paul telling us here? Your assignment this week is to find, oh, there are some people who do that all the time anyway. Uh, you take a grain or seed or something and you plant it. What else do you do? Your job is done. You may water it. If you put it outside with all this rain we've been getting lately, that's great. But your job is done. What can you do for that seed after you put it in the ground? Nothing. Guess what? Just because you're done, God did, did not even start working yet. That's when he begins. God begins, and what does he do? God sends the rain. Oh, you didn't even thank him for the rain. Oh, man, too much rain. No, God sends the rain because some farmers somewhere need rain. Right? So with the rain, that seed is in ground now. Somehow it ex opens up. Who caused the seed to open up? Ouch. He did. And who is he? God. See, he's in the detail of things. Somebody prayed as we began this morning, he knows all our hairs, hair in our head. And I'm like, man, some people are not gracious. <laughs> but he's in control. He's in control. This is something that's buried. 
He allows that seed to explode on the ground, and after that, it pops out. And that seed grows. Where did the seed get the body? Within that little seed, everything that seed needed to become a giant tree was implanted by God when he allowed the seed to come to be. I was in school two weeks ago, and I usually do a little do now with my kids. I forgot the question that I asked. But one student wrote, what came first, the chicken or the egg? There's some question people shouldn't throw at me <laughs> because you're gonna hear the truth. <laughs> the student posed the question, at this time there's another teacher that walked into the classroom and looked over what, see what she wrote and he's like, oh, this is very philosophical. And I'm like, what is it? I didn't get to see it yet. And he said, yeah, she wrote that what came first, the chicken or the egg? Okay. I arranged myself a little bit, and, I, and he said, well, it's a, and he, the teacher said, oh, that's a great debate. I'm like, debate? What do you mean debate? He said, yeah, that's a great debate. What came first, the chicken? I'm like, no, the, egg, the chicken came first because God created the chicken in a story. And he looked at me, he walked out of the room. The egg couldn't have come if there was not a creator. God said, let there be. See, and I told them, I told my class, when you remove God out of the equation, you get stupidity. They don't want me in that classroom, but I'm there. <laughs> so let's continue with this grain. Hopefully we'll get out of this dirt. So now the same seed will grow. And it becomes, it will have a body. It will grow to a specific height. Maybe this grain will produce or not produce. But guess what? It's all of God. And let's take, compare, compare this for a moment. Did you choose your parent? No. You had nothing to do with your first natural birth. Nothing. It's the same way you have nothing to do with your spiritual birth. It's all of God. See, God calls you. He called you. If it remove the sovereignty of God and everything that you do, you're going to have a problem. But when you see that, God, understand that God is sovereign, it causes you to be born again. And you say, Lord, thank you for saving me. The man in Luke 18, what did he do? Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Now, one writer argues, the seed which contained the fullest potential of life ceases to be a seed so that the plant inside may live. This is so true. A seed must die to produce a harvest. One seed is to be sacrificed. It must die to produce new life. End of quote. From one seed's demise, one obtained numerous yields and return. And guess what? It starts with from one seed. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus also set forth the concept of his glory. In John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me. Who, who did, who did, what did, whom did God give to Jesus? The church, the bride of Christ. And when did God give the church to Christ? In eternity past. Before nothing existed. Because he loved you from an everlasting love.
I desire they also whom you have given to me be with me. And Jesus doesn't pray any prayer that, that doesn't, do not get answered. So if he prayed for you to be with him, do you think you're going to end up there? Yes, you will. Oh, brother, but you don't understand. I don't need to understand anything. Christ prayed for me. I'm going to be home. And where is home? Wherever God is. Why? Look at the rest of the verse in John 17, 24. Whom you have given me, be with me where I am. Why? So that they may see my glory. Do you understand? You're going to see the glory. The glory Moses begged to see. And God told him, Moses, you cannot look at me and leave. I will explode you. You will vaporize. But you will see that glory. It's coming. For you love me before the foundation of the world. This is why I make the argument, all this happened before the foundation of the world. This was prearranged. See, the children who were born into the kingdom of God through salvation in Christ are, part, are a part of his glorification. You are part of that glory. Are you in Christ? Then if you are, you're part of that glory. You are part of the much fruit of the illustration in verse 24. And immediately, immediately, Christ quickly turns to the theme of discipleship as well. Christ's death produces eternal life for those who are willing to follow, hitting their sins and their lives. And John 12, 32 said, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth. What is that? The cross, which is a few days away. What will that do? Will draw, will call, will beckon, will bring all men. Well, all men, he includes all those chosen by the Father, men, women, boys, and girls, to myself. See, there we see the hour of his glorification. This is what is unpacking on whom? On Gentiles, on Greeks, on people who are not Jews. Why? Because it's the time of the Gentiles. Then some guy who holds his Bible upside down says, you know what, God is done with the Jewish people. <sighs> you just don't know scripture. If I had the power, some people, I would just zap them out of television and they couldn't talk anymore because they are dumping too much trash. He has set them aside for a time because of their rebellion. That's why we read in Romans uh, in, in, in earlier this morning. He set them for a time. But why? It's the time of the Gentiles. After the time of the Gentile is over, the Jewish people will do what God has called you to do. Guess what? No one disobeys God. And they will do what they were called to do. They're going to bring the gospel. We see the hour of his glorification. We see the seed. See the two work together so they can produce maximum benefit to all. Why? Because it is at the right time, and it is the right seed. See, God planned it all, and now the hour has arrived. Therefore, the seed will die to produce the desired outcome, which will atone for sin and redemption of those chosen by the Father. It is the same concept of death and giving life for many. Of all the religious leaders, that ever walked this planet. None of them ever walked out of the grave. They are still, their ashes are still somewhere. And many of them, if not all, are right now screaming in hell. But there is one. You could pay thousands of dollars and go to Israel and when you walk in, you're not going to find anything because he's not here, the angel says. He is risen. And that's the Savior, Jesus Christ. These leaders are dead in their sin. But by dying, Jesus made salvation possible for all 
who come to him savingly and repent of their sin. If the seed does not die, it remains alone. Nothing can or will happen if the seed does not die. As Jesus said, Jesus died. As such, Jesus died and rose from the dead. Jesus is the only savior, the only way to heaven. And this is the only gospel that saves because it is the true gospel. And there is no better gospel and there is no greater savior. Look at verse 25, and he loves, and he who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. Life is soul. It should be translated soul. See, in today's world, this strict statement runs absolutely contrary to the temporal concern of the crowd who cried, Hosanna, save us. Yet, Jesus tells them, lose your life now and save it for eternity. Be honored not by men, but by heaven, by the heavenly Father. And they rejected the message. Today, now, is the acceptable time to repent. The hymn writer put it this way. Come, everyone who is thirsty in spirit. Come, everyone who is weary and sad. Come to the fountain. There is fullness in Jesus. All that you're longing for, come and be glad. See, John reminds us in John 5, 39 and 40, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. It is these that bear witness about me and you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. John 3, 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light, than the light, for their deeds were evil. Matthew 16, 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeit his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Luke 12, 20, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? Again, in the Bible, what is a fool? A fool is one who has said, God, no, Psalm 14, 1. Job 27, 8 tells us, what is the hope of the godless when he's cut off, when, when God requires his soul? And this is the thing that we, we gotta take home on this point here, at death, you have lost it all if you are not in Christ. You have made a foolish and deadly choice, and now you will face severe consequences for this ungodly decision. Listen to Psalm 49, 7. Truly, no man can redeem his brother. He cannot give to God a ransom for him. Why is that? Verse 8, the redemption for the redemption price for the soul is costly. It ceases forever. What is this thing here? I cannot pay for my own sin. Even if I were to go to hell for 20 billion years, I will never get out because I cannot pay for my sin. If I can't pay for my sins, can I pay for the sins of my wife, my children, my grandchildren? I can't. That's why the redemption of the soul is costly. And who knows the value of a soul? God alone. This is why God provided the Savior, the Redeemer. So where do I go? What do I do? I need to run to the one who can. But there is one who can. There is one who did. And who is this? Jesus Christ. You run to him. You come to him. So you must decide now on this side of heaven while you have breath before you died. Because after you're dead, it's too late. It's too late. See, you work hard, you say, you know, I want all this, and guess what? They come to a point, and it's like, wait a minute, but I have accomplished all this. Who am I going to live this for? I'm not going to have time to enjoy this. Somebody is going to come behind, and who knows if they're going to be wise with what I've done. 
but it's too late. You made an eternal mistake. It's too late. You must come to the Savior. You must come to the Redeemer. See, knowing that if you forsake Christ in this life, then you will be damned in hell forever. Hell is endless, a place without mercy, without grace, without compassion, without forgiveness, without redemption. Are you sure you want to make that choice? Matthew 12, 30 tells us, he who's not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. You see, by not deciding to come to Christ, you already decided. Really? Yes. Because if you are not in Christ, you are against Christ. John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already. You are already judged. Because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Understand that such a choice has eternal implication. If you are ashamed of Christ in this life, Christ will be ashamed of you as well in the next life. And not only that, there is a ju judgment against you because you came in this world as a sinner, depraved and debased. How would you escape hell? By denying the Savior and rejecting the sacrifice of God's Son on the cross, which is the only payment for sin. Hebrews 10, 29 reminds us, how much worse punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has regarded as defiled the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has insulted the spirit of grace? Then the, word of, then the God who created all things will bring to you judgment. And who's going to be judging you? The very person you rejected, Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, 31, 10 and 31 tells us, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine. Hey, people who preach you God is love, 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 and tell, don't tell you there are consequences, there is a judgment, they're coming. They are not doing you, they are not being faithful to the preaching of the word of God. Vengeance is mine, and I will repay. Again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. So where do you find your hope? In Christ alone. And in closing, look at verse 26. If anyone is serving me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If everyone, anyone is serving me, the Father will honor him. Beloved, follow Christ. Be with Christ and serve Christ. Christian, Jesus will not forget your labor. Jesus will not abuse you. We live in a cutthroat society. People will step on anybody to get ahead, to get to the top, but not Christ. Jesus will not steal or overlook your effort. The troubles you've endured for his namesake. Beloved, the persecution and oppression you went through were not in vain. The faithfulness you have displayed on the field for the work of the gospel are not forgotten. Be steadfast, stand fast, and stand strong. I don't know if you heard the news last week, there were two missionaries in, in Haiti and they were killed by gangs. Instant death, instant glory. Beloved, Jesus will reward you on that day for your diligence and struggle. So what do we do? Keep the faith and finish well. Let's pray. Man, please wait upon us. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you, Father, for the love you have shown because of the cross, because of the power of the cross. 
we understand mercy, we understand grace. Not to an extent, but we can appreciate it. For we were not a people, and now we are the people of God. We thank you for the redeeming, loving, gracious Savior you sent to die on behalf of wretched sinners and to make us part of the family of God. And Peter tells us we are royal priesthood. We are part of the family of God. And we were in darkness without hope, without Christ, but because of your mercy and grace, we have come to the Savior. And we want to say thank you, Father, for without you, as the hymn writer said, where would I be without you? We don't want to ponder that too much, but we need to consider it. We thank you for the hope. We thank you for the grace. We thank you for the mercy that we have in Christ and in Christ alone to the power of the gospel that redeems and saves and secures us and keeps us. And Lord, may we be faithful. May we look to the cross. And may we remember there was a price that was paid for sinners' sake. We can't do this on our own. And we are thankful that you promise us, I will never, ever leave you alone. And this is sign in blood, the blood of the Lamb, to redeem sinners. Thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for this time. Lord, we do pray. May you visit your people. May they understand the time of their visitation so they would not be ignorant. So we know the time is now, not tomorrow, not this afternoon, but now is the time of their visitation to be made right with God so they can come to the Savior and be redeemed and have all their sins forgiven. Thank you for this time, Lord, we do pray, and thank you for your mercy and all you do for us, Father. We thank you, we bless your holy name, and we ask all, the, all this in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus, to whom we give glory and praise forever and ever. Amen.